Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Phi Kappa Phi Love of Learning panel. We do this panel every semester during Scholars Week, so we are glad that this is being offered during the Spring Scholars Week of 2021. And we have um, three presentations, and I will present as well if, if time permits, but our three big ones. Uh, we're going to start first with Dr. Miranda uh, Sanford Terry, and then the next person to present is a graduate student, Madeline Aselli, and then our third presenter will be Dr. Anche Gamble, and they can introduce themselves more if, if necessary at the beginning of their presentation. We are going to start first with Dr. Terry, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, well, um, last time we did this, I actually had a presentation, but this time I'm just going to uh, talk because uh, quite a few different projects are going on. So um, I'm Dr. Miranda Sanford Terry, as uh, previously mentioned, and my background is in public and community health, and then I specialize in disability studies. And <clears throat> In the last few years at Murray State, I've been more of a generalist when it comes to public health. And so that has included um, access to healthcare services as well as adult vaccination education. And that's been very timely right now, given COVID. Um, but we actually started this project when the state of Kentucky had a hepatitis A outbreak. And hepatitis A is also one of those preventable diseases that has a vaccination available and yet people hadn't been getting it. And so we were trying to look at what the barriers were to vaccinations. And when it comes to adults, there's not that catch all kind of like there is in public schools where the kids have to provide their immunization records. And so where are the adults lacking that information of continuing on getting their boosters? And if they're not choosing to get their boosters, what are the barriers that they're seeing? And it was honestly um, not the original intent of the project. When we started, we were actually looking at barriers to primary care physicians in Western Kentucky and in a rural area. And what we found is that individuals were getting their preventative screenings and it was part of a grant that Callaway County Health Department had um, looking at adult um, preventative screening, so mammograms, pap smears, prostate exams, et cetera. And we went ahead and added vaccinations in there because, again, the hepatitis A outbreak. And what we found is adults just weren't keeping up on their boosters. And a lot of it came down to they all had primary care physicians, but their primary care physician was not following up and asking them when's the last time they had their uh, tetanus booster and you're supposed to get your tetanus booster every 10 years. And when you're looking at the United States um, category, it's or statistics, it's less than about 12% which I will say um, in Western Kentucky, our uh, tetanus shot boosters are actually quite high. I think we were at 57%, which is great, but that also could be because we have a lot more farmers and factory workers. And so if they're injured, then they automatically have to get one. And so that was kind of an interesting thing. And so when we're looking at the data, I'm like, we definitely need to follow up on that. But most um, adults are choosing not to get the flu vaccination because they just don't see the point. And some of their other um, vaccinations, they were just scared or they didn't have funds or they just didn't have the time. And so looking at those barriers and then now we throw COVID into the mix and, you know, in a rural area, we're hearing a lot of stuff such as um, it's a hoax. They're scared. Um, they don't want to be guinea pigs. So we hear that a lot. Um, the, the rumor about being microchipped, they don't want to be microchipped. And so now we're hearing a lot of other things. And as I mentioned at the beginning, disability studies is where my background is. And so most people are like, well, how are those things connected? Well, if you know the background of polio, you know um, that is also a preventable disease, but it's had a long history of 
um, making adults um, have disabilities and it was in, inflicting kids. And so those were lifelong disabilities. Well, COVID starting to have the same impacts with long-term lung disease and some of the other implications that we're not even aware of yet. And so it's kind of interesting because the military at one point said that anybody who had contracted COVID that they were automatically going to be disqualified. And that's a huge, uh, a huge hit to rural Americans because some of them go into the military because they don't have any other options. And so that's one of their ways of getting out of where they're at, getting out of poverty, and that's a career choice. And so if they have COVID and they've contracted it, now that whole career opportunity is now missing for them. Now, the military has since gone back on that, but we don't know right now if um, if lung functioning is going to be one of those things that's a disqualification, kind of like back in the day, if you had flat feet, you were disqualified from the army. So looking at those little things, it's just definitely going to be interesting. And so <clears throat> that, that project, that research project kind of came out of nowhere, but then it's turned into such a timely project. And so it's kind of spun off into its own little thing. So that's kind of what I'm working on now. And, and like I said, it's grown into this other um, aspect. And one of my students, um, she'll be presenting uh, next week at Kentucky Public Health Association, um, looking at COVID policies and mental health. And um, I don't know how many of you had followed on Facebook, but there was an outcry about how most universities got rid of their spring break and what implications that that had on mental health. And that's things that a lot of the administrators did not take into consideration. And I personally serve on um, one of our local school boards, and that was one of the big things that we were concerned about with our students. So we made sure that we implemented a spring break. And so our students had that last week. Um, so that's why our school board's meeting this week, but we try to take that into consideration. And so we, we wish that other people would take those things into consideration too. But again, all of it kind of plays together and all interrelated. And um, I'm glad that I had this opportunity to share those things. So thank you. We can do a virtual applause. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Terry. I appreciate that. And we, um, when we, everyone presents, then we'll, you know, have an opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Madeline. Hey, um, I actually have a um, little PowerPoint um, that I threw together. Um, can you all see my screen shared? Yes. Okay. So my name is Madeline Isley and I'm a graduate student and I'm also from out of state. Um, so I've been, I'm a history major. So I've been very curious about the culture of the purchase area and um, the Southern heritage and um, like the Tater Day Festival that I hear so much about. Um, so I started looking towards the history of the area using primary sources to see what I could find. And I found that in the, in the Jackson Purchase area and all across America, um, African Americans and several other minority groups were targets of violence and expulsion throughout the 20th century. Um, and after research, I feel that it's never really been sufficiently acknowledged. Um, so towns where these incidents occurred are referred to as sundown towns. Um, and part of the problem is that they're pretty absent from the historical record. So my research ultimately reveals that the different instances of violence and expulsion that occurred in the Jackson Purchase area in the early 20th century weren't isolated events, but they resulted from inflamed individual hatreds and essentially a collective campaign to rid the entire region and surrounding areas of African Americans. Um, and my research equates that to ethnic cleansing. Um, so the narrative of this starts at the end of the Civil War, which signaled freedom to African Americans, but threatened many whites nationwide. And post-war harassment caused many African Americans to establish local Southern all-Black communities. 
Um, and then later, one million others moved north in the Great Migration. Um, so then the, quote, Negro problem um, thus became a national pseudo problem. So then desperate to preserve their society, many white Southerners revised history to valorize this idea of this old South and their new South and the lost cause Confederacy. Um, and then white Northerners prepared for the oncoming surge of supposedly unwanted African-American neighbors. Um, so then society was just kind of cracking along tense lines. Um, and in the Jackson Purchase area specifically, they had a conference called the Second Annual Southern Conference on Quarantine and Immigration in 1906. And it showed a growing consensus of opinion that African Americans were supposedly holding the South back from making the land, quote, a literally a white man's country. Um, so documents reveal that Jackson Purchase region whites feared the consequences of change and incited violence in a program to restore their supposed white utopia. Um, so then their answer to the, the race question was a collective campaign to rid the entire region. Um, and so um, race relations were systematically worsening between 1890 and 1940. Um, and a lot of attention is bestowed upon extra, extra legal race relations practices such as lynchings. Um, and I, I think that at least 186 African Americans were lynched in Kentucky and 50 killings occurred in the purchase area alone. Um, but sundown towns are largely omitted from the historical record. Um, and they're defined as any organized jurisdiction that for decades kept most African-Americans or other groups from living in it. And there's limited exceptions, but sundown towns were thus all white on purpose. Um, so through either policy, violence, or subtle intimidation, white Americans established thousands of towns, suburbs, counties, and communities for whites only. Um, and thousands of towns exist across America um, and the numbers are kind of shocking. There's 62 discovered in Kentucky thus far and almost 500 in Illinois alone. Um, so towns where racial violence and expulsion occurred are shockingly still majority white towns by margins over 75%. Um, but residents of course of those towns either don't know about it or they conceal that because to retain that naturally all white image, um, they avoid the history of how they achieved it kind of subconsciously. Um, and I feel like that's how racism is concealed and can survive through the generations and then be violently actualized. Um, so then sundown towns are thus named as they're referring to, owing to the racist messages that were placed on signs. Um, because after sundown, they were at the mercy of whatever the local white mobs had in mind. Um, and surprisingly, the majority of sundown towns weren't achieved through violence, but through the nonverbal power dynamics and attitudes that worked so well to just deplete populations. Um, because after news of these events spread quickly in newspapers and warning signs in recent rumors of attacks alerted African-Americans nationwide. Um, so then early cases of horrific violence kind of set the stage and set the precedent for creating all white towns. Um, and they used violence, arson, sirens, signage. Um, but in cases, in cases thereafter, um, the unspoken threats and the subtle intimidations were enough to make minorities feel unwelcome. Um, and so in the Jackson Purchase region specifically, I, my research narrowed in on Marshall County. Um, it's one of the eight counties within the Purchase region and it's home to over 31,000 people. Um, but only 0.5% of those people are African-American. And comparatively, the neighborhood town of Murray, um, which is where I go to college, um, it 
has had 6% of African Americans in a steady population of 20,000 around that for the past two decades. Um, so the sharp contrast isn't really unintentional. Um, Marshall history, Marshall County's history was unexplored for over a century. So no one really questioned how African Americans almost altogether disappeared entirely. Um, but it wasn't that they didn't want to live in the purchase region. It was that they were quote, not welcome. And so things started with the Black Patch Tobacco War, which was between 1904 and 1909, which allowed white residents of the purchase region to actualize their racial aggressions against the backdrop of economic warfare. And um, the Dark Tobacco District Planters Protective Association um, would raid tobacco farms to protest the American Tobacco Company. And their, their minutes on the, their meetings and the meeting minutes on the economic state would transform into aggressive discussions of the N-word problem. Um, and their paramilitary gang of over 10,000 members became known as the Night Riders as their violence turned into carefully planned and nocturnal attacks on African-American farmers and residents. Um, and after raiding various Kentucky towns and counties and long before the atrocities in Corbin, Kentucky, um, the African-American population within the town of Birmingham was a tempting target. Um, and so in April, 1908, squads cut the town's telephone lines and patrolled the streets while others raided and burned homes to drive out all the African Americans in the town. Um, more than a dozen were directed toward a nearby river and tortured for almost an hour and were ordered to quote, leave Birmingham and remain away. Um, they recorded children as begging, quote, don't kill us all, don't shoot us all. Um, several victims were murdered. Um, and the rule of law in the Purchase region had just collapsed in the following months um, from night riders, farmers, and some townspeople just raiding towns throughout the region. Um, notices were posted in the Jackson Purchase area, like some of the signs in the past slide, um, and some towns were deserted within hours. And by 1919, when the Kentucky State Guard arrived to try and restore law and order in the region, African-Americans had been violated and expelled from at least seven towns within four counties surrounding and within the Jackson Purchase region. Um, and that includes attempts in Murray in Callaway County, Kentucky, um, which you can see on the newspaper clipping on the top right, if you can um, read that very well. Um, and the most common one of, the, one of the interesting aspects is, is because this is most common to the purchase area is that this image of a black mule reportedly signaled to African-Americans to quote, get their black ass out. Um, and that still exists in some areas of the Jackson Purchase carved into um, stone and things like that. And I haven't personally seen that, but that's what I've heard. Um, so signs warning African Americans to stay out of the area were reportedly placed on both the east and west sides of the region. Um, and just outside the east of the purchase um, in Rock Castle County, I believe, which has an all white population of almost 15,000. Um, I read that a sundown sign was in place as late as the mid 1990s. Um, and during my time here, I noticed that purchase residents don't seem to acknowledge this. Um, there are rumors of Marshall County's history, but no complete story. Um, and they certainly don't acknowledge the few hundreds of African Americans who mysteriously disappeared. Um, so the Marshall County African American community settled in Birmingham in 1853 and the town has since been conveniently buried underneath 
artificial lake waters by the Kentucky Dam. Um, and the Kentucky Dam was actually built later partly by some African Americans in what they called a segregated Negro village site. And they were expelled after completion. Um, and so part of the reason why this is so um, unacknowledged is because the town, um, there's not really that many remains. Um, and several Knight Rider perpetrators faced lawful trial and prosecution, but the judicial process was pretty perfunctory and just going through the motions. So the majority of perpetrators faced no consequences or even societal backlash. Um, but I feel like the footprints of hatred kind of outlive the community um, because we can still see um, hatreds in our society today, just as we can across America and across the world. Um, and it essentially brands the entire Purchase region a sundown town legacy. Um, so part of my research focuses in on media reports and reactions, because I found that in a wide variety of the newspapers I was looking at, 19th and 20th century American newspaper archives, they reveal a prejudiced consensus against African Americans, largely in Southern media. Um, Southern newspapers were quick to report instances of racial violence and expulsions, which is great, but their witnesses and sources were predominantly white. And writers were swift to question a victim's judgment rather than a perpetrator's mindset. So they would focus on the whereabouts of the quote coloreds and why they were in town at all, rather than assessing the intentions and inducements of the white mob's activities. And detailed accounts reflected this white outrage at African-American presence rather than delineating the hate crimes the whites committed. Um, so collectively, Southern newspapers reflected that hateful attitudes in the Jackson Purchase region seemed to be the rule and the norm and not necessarily the exception. And one article which I focused in on um, is, which is pictured, um, mob law, Marshall County broke loose again. Um, it details a Marshall County expulsion that occurred in 1896. And the strategic use of the residents quotes, um, which some of which I chose not to include in this picture, um, but one of them was quote, well, I'll have me an N word tonight, sure. Um, it warns African-Americans and it seems to even encourage the perpetrators um, because further events prove that effective. Um, and the headline alone implies that um, this was not one isolated event. Um, the word again, it kind of highlighted, um, it implies that it's an intention series of atrocities and deadly incidents that date back to the 1890s. Um, so it states it was an accident that none were killed, um, which I feel kind of implies that it reinforces that death of African-Americans was the regionally known purpose of these acts. Um, and the article focused on the coloreds in an in inhumane fashion and seemed more to monitor them rather than better human welfare. Um, and then the admission that quote, antip antipathy to the colored race has existed for the past 30 years. They are not safe after sundown. It, end quote, that might have well have been their ticket out of town. Um, so then over a decade later, similar thoughts occurred to the African-Americans in Birmingham. And a different newspaper addressed the notices to quote, leave or else posted in Marshall County and read that quote, only six N words remain. They are thoroughly intimidated and it is the rightful general opinion that every colored person in Benton will leave. And amidst this scare and violence upon African-Americans in the region, the newspaper headlines the next day read, quote, quiet at Benton, 
everything is peaceful here, even despite quieting rumors. And in the same newspaper, they also reported that, quote, only one colored family now remains in Benton. So how they could see that one colored family remaining in Benton, right next to a post that says everything is peaceful there is kind of, um, it really stands out. And the population diversity statistics in the Jackson Purchase region, and like in many towns across America have just never really recovered. So my research um, primarily equates um, what occurred across America, um, racial violence and expulsions to ethnic cleansing, which the United Nations considers a crime against humanity and a characteristic of genocide. And that is defined on the screen. And I feel that the definition correctly, um, correctly reflects the incidents that occurred. Um, and many counties and states surrounding Western Kentucky and the Purchase region passed legislation acknowledging and some even attempting to repair the wrongdoings of past generations, um, specifically violence and expulsion. But the Jackson Purchase has yet to even acknowledge their violent, intentful instances of driving away and killing African Americans. And at the same time, we put these next two events, such as Tater Day or having um, Confederate flags branded across the community. Um, and there have been several instances of violence just in recent years that um, could indirectly be associated with this long line of hateful attitude and violence. Um, so hateful attitudes in the Purchase region connected to violent outbursts in this collective campaign intended to rid the region of lives that whites considered expendable. Um, and I feel that it's ingrained and socially conditioned into the subconscious um, that hateful attitudes and ideas of superiority survive by tradition. And namely, I narrow in on ideas of Southern heritage that I've heard since coming to the area. Um, and I feel that this dangerous glorification of tradition and cults of antiquity just promote the hatreds and crimes against humanity that still occur today. So therefore, not only does living in the past inhibit progress, but it detriments any attempt for progression. Um, so it seems to me, based on my research, that ideas of heritage and tradition just minimize these age-old hatreds that have no logical justification. And many people I've asked from the area, um, because I did a lot of interviews of people that are from this area to feel that, to see if my reflections were accurate. Um, um, it seems that many people I've asked, they don't really know or don't really have um, justified answers for why their why their culture is like this, or what Southern heritage really is, um, and I feel that it reflects hidden antiquated racism, whether or not it's direct or admitted. Um, so concealing this and disregarding this history, like it has been in the historical record, just furthers this hateful ideology. Um, so my research ultimately concludes that the Jackson Purchase should acknowledge their past socially and legally to start the journey towards progress. Um, and that Marshall County be recognized as a sundown town and that the Jackson Purchase be considered a sundown region um, and that it be accounted for as an ethnic cleansing. Um, and then we can begin to work on preventing racial violence and eradicating hatred so we can have a nice sunshiny future um, and hopefully shed light on sundown. Thank you. Excellent research. Thank you so much for sharing that. Appreciate that. Dr. Gamble. All right. Let me get this going. 
Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Anja Gamble. I teach art history here at Murray State, and my specialty is uh, Italian sculpture in during fascism in the Cold War and the exhibition of it. And so this is um, an essay, uh, comes from an essay that I'm working on for a book that is all about curating fascism uh, after the war. So one of the things that um, a lot of scholars, especially of Italian fascism, but also of other fascist and authoritarian regimes are interested in right now is um, how have they been displayed for the public, the artifacts, including artwork, uh, but also how that might affect the way that we see fascism as uh, particularly in the Italian case, but this is true in the German case as well, as something that's in the past and uh, that culture was somehow not part of it. Um, and it really just opens up uh, the possibilities for the kind of neo-fascism that we see today. Um, although fascism and authoritarian dictatorships have existed since the early 20th century, um, it's not like it ended with the, the Second World War. Um, it's uh, it spread basically through the help of the Americans in, in the most part, um, unfortunately, uh, throughout uh, places like Africa um, and South and Central America. So today I'm gonna be focusing on uh, Italian fascist exhibitions or exhibitions of Italian fascist era artwork. And uh, the crux of, of the argument kind of also stems from this idea that uh, artwork supported either directly or indirectly um, produced under the Italian uh, fascist regime uh, had a stake in Italian fascism. And, and partially it came from a top-down method, um, the kind of propaganda from the, the Italian fascist regime from Mussolini himself uh, was that modernity was a reflection of fascism. So modern art, avant-garde art was a reflection of good fascism, um, whether or not those artists were say enthusiastic fascist members um, some, of course, definitely were, <laughs> but not all of them necessarily were, but they benefited from the fascist state. And uh, after the Second World War, both Italy and, and importantly, the United States worked very, very hard to separate modern Italian art from fascism. And that had a few uh, important um, both effects and reasons. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. And um, the kind of pendant to this talk and this discussion are these two shows. Um, the uh, first major exhibition of Italian art um, in the US uh, ever, but also uh, in uh, right after the war, uh, this uh, process actually started before the war. Uh, and then they uh, took up this um, project in 46. So they wasted no time. <laughs> um, in uh, trying to get this exhibition happening at MoMA. And of course, um, uh, MoMA still is kind of embroiled in a, in a bit of a drama, but uh, MoMA in the 1940s was um, uh, very closely connected with the uh, kind of State Department. Uh, one, of the one of the founding uh, members of, or found founders of MoMA, her grandson is Nelson Rockefeller, who later becomes vice president. Um, he is integral to the kind of atrocities that happened in South America after the Second World War. Um, and initially this project for 20th century Italian art, um, the initial kind of um, exploratory um, phase was funded directly by the State Department under the Marshall Plan. They distanced themselves later as sentiment in Congress shifted away from uh, support uh, under the Marshall Plan for Art, um, and that has other important implications. Um, but it was very much uh, a, a kind of politicized exhibition, and the text in it is so obvious um, in that way, too. So, um, and then the most recent kind of comprehensive, comprehensive exhibition uh, that uh, was a, a little bit controversially titled Post Zang Tomb Tomb. It originally had a title that was more explicitly fascist. Post Zang Tomb Tomb is a, a phrase, a nonsensical phrase from a, a futurist poem. And of course the futurists were um, highly embedded in the, not, or in the fascist regime. 
Um, this exhibition was curated by the late Germano Taylant, who unfortunately we lost to COVID this last year. Um, he was a, a very important uh, art historian critic and um, curator. And this show happened at the Prada Museum or Prada Foundation in Milan. Um, and importantly, in 2018 is when um, Italy uh, saw the, uh, the kind of rise of number of neo-fascists in their own state um, uh, apparatus. So it was an important moment uh, for the show to go up. And one of the things I'm interested in is this concept of, of what I'm terming fascism light or fascist light. And uh, I track this from this early uh, immediate post-war moment at uh, MoMA all the way through to the Prada exhibition, even though the Prada exhibition in Chelant really emphatically uh, wanted to uh, contextualize fascist art, um, uh, but I, I, I think it ultimately fails in, in certain ways, um, in part because of the precedent set up by MoMA for international exhibition of fascist era artwork. Um, and uh, one of the kind of important cruxes uh, is uh, kind of de or separating the artwork from the context. And so in MoMA, they do it by kind of selecting certain artworks that do not depict fascist themes. They basically erase fascist connections from a number of works or uh, in the case of the futurists and we're seeing the kind of entry room for the futurist section of the MoMA exhibition below, um, only showing pre-World War I futurism, which had really huge effects to the 20th century. Even when I was an undergraduate, uh, I learned that futurism after the First World War wasn't real futurism. It was second wave futurism. It wasn't the same. Um, and that, oh, well, it was bad avant-garde art because it was fascist, um, which uh, is absurd for lots of reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, particularly because the, the kind of leader of the futurists um, uh, F.T. Medinetti was really a fairly close friend of Mussolini, even though they had their falling outs and comings together. Um, and so, uh, and then we see that in, in a kind of weird way above in this exhibition that happened at the Prada in Milan in 2018. And um, what was kind of really great as a historian of fascism to see the show is that they basically blew up facsimiles of fascist era exhibitions and then placed the artwork. So what you're seeing, I, sorry, it's a bad scan of the catalog because you couldn't take photos in the exhibition, but um, uh, where it's color there, that was the actual artwork hanging in the gallery. And then everything that's black and white, there is a facsimile printed to scale from archival photographs. So it was really cool. Um, and it was great to see kind of how the different exhibitions at different time periods during the regime uh, played out. Um, but there were really important uh, caveats to that. Um, uh, you see in the kind of image on the left, I circle it, uh, it in pink. Each room had an accompanying like list of fascist events in tiny, tiny print in, uh, in both English and Italian, um, as is really common in Italian exhibitions uh, because of tourism, right? Um, but uh, most people didn't stop and read them. And this is true in general for uh, curators thinking about exhibition text. Um, often you just, you know, most visitors, unless you're a, a huge nerd like me, um, don't read all the text, especially if there's a big block of text. And so you're just left with the um, kind of perpetuation of fascist spectacle because they were really good at it. And, um, and so that's a kind of thread, right? Uh, MoMA starts by utilizing, right? They really capture um, a fascist spectacle, uh, the use of artwork to glorify the regime, perpetuate that by basically uh, kind of erasing uh, its connection to fascism. And even though the Prada exhibition purported to and in, 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 uh, tried to in certain ways, I still think they kind of failed um, uh, in doing that. There was basically no discussion of the Holocaust until the very end 
Um, and then it was inaccurate, I would say, to be nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's lots of other things I could talk about. But to think about the MoMA show, these are these lovely archival photographs of people looking at artwork um, that, of course, the museum always takes. Uh, but uh, one of the ways that uh, MoMA really segregated uh, uh, Italian art from fascism was by presenting it as art that was apolitical, right? This is a theme within MoMA's uh, kind of exhibition design. Their uh, one time, uh, um, the founding director who was now uh, uh, just a curator, there's kind of drama with that, but Alfred Barr Jr who was one of the cu two curators of this exhibition. Um, he was criticized even at the time for uh, uh, kind of disassociating artwork from its historical context. And that was reinforced in this exhibition um, in part through these publicity photos, but also in the, in the exhibition display, um, uh, what in art history we call the white cube. Uh, where artworks have uh, ample space on either side so you can stop and contemplate their aesthetics. Um, and so that perpetuates this idea that art is, is somehow always disconnected from its kind of politics, uh, which is really dangerous when you're talking about artwork that was supported uh, under a fascist regime. Um, this is, uh, and so the easy thing to say is like, oh, well, the curators must just not have known, uh, which is obviously not true uh, because these people are professionals, but also um, even more so, um, Alfred Barr's wife is an Italian. Uh, so Margaret so Scolari Barr um, uh, is an Italian, Irish Italian um, and uh, who was in the United States in grad school when she met Alfred Barr. And she basically did all the translations for everything because he doesn't speak very good Italian, although um, Sobi does, the other co-curator. And they extensively traveled in Italy, not only for the exhibition, but uh, both uh, Bar and Scolari Bar. Um, her mother still lived in Rome. And so they saw basically every major fascist exhibition during fascism and uh, did nothing to uh, kind of call out Italian fascism, but were praised uh, because they helped artists leave Nazi Germany, but basically uh, said nothing about Mussolini and the fascist regime in Italy, which of course lasted for 20 years where the uh, Nazi regime lasted less than 10. So um, uh, just to keep it brief, to give you more uh, kind of uh, images uh, quickly, uh, again, the, one of the big kind of whitewashing of the uh, fascist support for art is in the futurism section. They just completely omit anything that happened uh, during the fascist regime, which started in, in 1922 when Mussolini was uh, democratically elected as the um, ahead of the state. Uh, of course, Italy was a constitutional monarchy at that time. Um, and it completely ignored the fact that uh, basically every single artist in the exhibition had found support under the uh, fascist regime. And some of these people you may have heard of. So Lucio Fontana uh, made famous in the 1960s for his so-called slash paintings. That's a sculpture of his uh, the, uh, top center. Um, Arturo Martini, who is probably the most important sculptor in Italy in the early 20th century is in the top right. Marino Marini in the top or bottom left, um, won uh, best ex uh, kind of sculpture in 35 at the National Exhibition. And then uh, someone like Fausto Melotti, who also worked on commissions for the fascist government. Um, and they were, their connections to fascism was not even mentioned, completely not mentioned in the catalog. And, and basically ever since until the 1980s. <laughs> So it's really a kind of rehashing, you know, it really, I, I thought it spoke a lot to the last talk, right? This kind of like uh, a selective amnesia of history in order to support these people. And of course, both the Italians had stake in this because they wanted the market in the United States to support um, their 
uh, artwork. And so of course the artists aren't gonna be like, well, I kind of, fascism was okay. Um, they didn't do that. They all pretended they were anti-fascist, which wasn't always true. Um, but also the Americans uh, had a, a Cold War stake in Italy. Italy was, uh, had a huge number or a huge kind of community who were both socialist and communist, although not as closely associated with the USSR as the Americans had feared. And Italy was a strategic military location for the Americans in the Mediterranean. And so huge amount of money went into Italy after the Second World War. It was actually 11% of all Marshall Plan funds went to, the, to Italy. Um, and so huge um, amount of money. And so both sides. Um, another thing that happened at this exhibition is that some of the artists like Renato Gattuso, who is a very loud communist. Um, his uh, connections to leftist politics were um, uh, basically disregarded. They weren't discussed at all so as to fit within this narrative, even though he was making work and, and organizing against the fascist regime during the fascist regime. And so you think they would want to glorify that, but because he was doing it under the guise of communism, um, he, uh, that he was showcased, but not uh, discussed in that way. And so um, again, uh, my project looks at the resonances of that in these contemporary exhibitions that are trying to re kind of contextualize uh, fascist era artwork. Um, and there was a few earlier, they kind of again started in the 1980s. Uh, that's when historical scholarship also started to kind of dig into the fascist era. Um, uh, mostly with scholars who were either um, kind of children or uh, the children of folks who went through the fascist uh, time period. And so these are the major ones that I look at in my study. Um, uh, Ani Trento, which is um, year 30 or the 30s basically is what it translates to, um, uh, was at the uh, Strozzi in Florence, uh, Italian Futurism that was uh, curated by the uh, really awesome Vivian Green at the Guggenheim. Uh, and then the post saying tomb tomb at uh, the Prada. So I'm, I'll stop there just because um, I don't wanna uh, go over too much on time, but there's a kind of nutshell of the project I'm working on now. Excellent, wow. Thank you. Goodness. All right, we do have a few moments and I know I can get through mine really quickly because I have shared it for um, a class that I'm taking and when we get it up and then I will kind of walk through it and we had to um, produce a little like five minute video of our little research that we did. So um, I am taking a course, uh, a graduate course at the University of Kentucky. I'm working on uh, a master's degree in instructional design. And so the course that I'm taking is interpersonal communication in instruction. And it's an elective that I chose to take. So um, of course I wanted to try to keep everything in instruction as to what I'm doing. And one of the assignments is that we had to choose a construct that um, may or may not have been studied um, decently in interpersonal communication. So I'm not gonna say what it is right now because you're thinking what is she talking about or why, but even put it in students context, you know, what are you trying to teach me? Why are you trying to teach me this? Well, it goes to the construct of intention. And, you know, I've heard that word already in each of one of your presentations. And it's, it's amazing how this one word um, is used in so many different ways, but in the context of instruction, intention is something that has not been studied as much. So this was something I wanted to examine and I have examined it in the course. Um, it is being considered for a conference, a national conference later this year. Um, the professor in this course that um, she's wonderful, um, Dr. Brandy Frisbee, and she, um, some of us were interested in being on a panel in which we would be able to share interpersonal constructs and how we can use those to advance instruction. So um, hopefully we'll hear good news about it, but until then it was just a great project. And I'm also using this again as another stepping stone um, in the course, we have to do a final project, either a research or a, a training uh, program. And so I'm using this to work into a faculty development session. So um, there's a lot of implications for this. So 
I, I came across the construct of intention. Um, we had to find a construct and I was finding constructs such as rapport, clarity, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, and some others, oh, uh, nonverbal immediacy. And those have been covered um, rather extensively. And I wanted to find something that had not been covered. And this word kept popping up. I started at first with um, teacher um, clarity. And then when I was looking at some of the articles, I noticed the word intention. And it wasn't until some of the articles in 1990 there was actually a little debate that occurred in journals dealing with um, uh, communication studies. Uh, Stamp and Knapp actually took this concept and attempted to um, really demonstrate its importance. And a lot of communication scholars debated the nature and interpretation of it. So it kind of laid dormant for, for a while and it really has not been picked up much at all. It, especially in um, organizational communication and instruction. So I really find that, you know, really intention is central to how we teach communication as well as other things. So I really wanted to continue the work of Stamp and Nap and, and seeing how we can apply it for greater instructional purposes. It's conceptualized differently. I found some information about it in psychology um, also found information about it in other fields, biology, and I was like, wow, okay, so it's, it's interpreted differently across the disciplines. I first wanted to find out really how do we define it. So, of course, you know, you go to a dictionary to kind of get it going. And really what it means, according to Merriam-Webster, is it what one has in mind to do. Um, a synonym is intent, but that carries more of the legal discourse with that as far as deliberateness um, or trying to formulate a course of action. Um, so I wanted to steer clear of that. So I had to come up with my own definition and even Stamp and Knapp um, took to the 1984 version in the dictionary, the general word implying having something uh, in mind as a plan or design. And I thought I could work with that a little bit better. Um, and then it goes on to define it even more. Um, intention uh, to communication occurs when we select the option to act upon the goal um, by encoding a message for reception by another. So I thought, okay, somehow we need to take the word intention and put it really, I think on the burden of the instructor. That's really where it starts in many ways. So I took that and I came up with uh, this definition. It's communication planned or designed around a learning goal by the instructor through cognitive decisions. So we've got the responsibility, instructors do. Um, and so we, we act as the encoder. We're sending a message um, and, and not just sending the message. The thing is we've planned that message. So there's this active intent. And so that message carries through whatever filters are necessary because the student's gonna be decoding that. Um, so when the student decodes it, that student already is attributing that intention back to the instructor in some way. So there's some meaning being made um, based on that observable behavior. So therefore the instructor initiates the teaching and learning process by charting a clear path for the learning to start and follow successfully. So in the literature that I've done, I found three basic themes. Um, like I said, um, one was in child psychology and also a little bit in biology, but I, I saw more of the um, intention in, in child psychology. Interactional relationships, um, being that it is an interpersonal construct um, and not just interpersonal, but you know, if I intend to do something, I'm just going to do it. And then whatever might be the recipient of that, um, then it, it just carries it on out. So there's more of an, a transactional maybe even perhaps there. So that intention and instruction, there is some, but not a whole lot. But these three themes really help to shape intention then as this both an interpersonal and then definitely as an instructional construct. So what do I really plan to do with this? Well, since that we've got direction being established in the communication process in the classroom, whether it's online or, or in person, um, then basically it's, it's starting as this foundational construct. So that way other behaviors or variables will occur. So one of the things that I like to try to do is that before I even tell students 
or really before I sign anything for them to do, I've got to be able to tell them why they are doing it. So there's the intent. So I'm communicating that intent to the student, why they are doing this. Why is it important for this assignment to be completed? Um, and then I confirm my intent by making sure that definitely the assignment or the project or whatever the activity, it is going to align with whatever the learning objectives might be. And then in doing so, then the clarity of intention is um, designed better for definitely for the instructor, but then definitely for the learner um, through those task instructions. So I mentioned earlier about clarity. Clarity is a known um, instructional communication construct. And um, I could see how maybe somebody who might be watching this could argue that, well, isn't that just the same thing as clarity? Not really, because even though they are related, but intent negotiates clarity. And in other words, again, it has to be that foundational principle first to be established um, before that clarity can be really observed. So there are a couple of questions I still have about this, you know, really how could then, knowing that what we know now, how could the scholarship of teaching and learning carry this on through some more? And then more importantly, what are some immediate strategies that instructors could do right now to really enhance then that clarity of intention? And some of you, um, I, I think Dr. Terry, you might've seen this um, already, but one of the things I've learned about quite a bit in the past couple of years is this TILT framework. I won't go into too many specifics, but it has three criteria, uh, purpose, task, and then criteria for success. So the purpose is really where that intent is. I'm telling students why they are doing it. And in doing so, I map it back to the learning objective. Uh, perhaps there's a, um, another assignment upcoming that if they do this assignment, it scaffolds into the next one. Um, the task, these are the instructions I want you to complete. It can be a checklist. It could also be your assignment should look something like this. It could also be um, some uh, maybe instructions to tell the student, you're probably going to encounter this error. And if you do, great, you're doing this right. You know, just something to give them a pathway as to what um, they might be doing right. It confirms to the student your intent. And then criteria for success, um, how is that student going to be evaluated? Will you use a rubric? Um, will that student receive full points, um, et cetera? And then plus two, you can tie it back into the purpose if you need to. So this shows that link a little bit better between then the intent, definitely with the cognitive um, domain, but the other domains really also have not been explored as much, the affective and the behavioral. In fact, it's funny how, um, in my course that I'm taking, um, we just read a journal article this week that talked about how um, affirmative seeking behavior. So when instructors want students, yes, we want students to like us, but we also want them to like the stuff that we're teaching. Um, so what are some behaviors we might do? Well, maybe some nonverbal immediacy, you know, we nod and maybe we're um, trying to establish our credibility some more, um, enjoyment, you know, those types of things. Um, so we're trying to reach that effective level a little bit. So that way the students, again, will see our intent maybe a little bit better, um, but that hasn't been studied as much. And then again, instructor must describe the intent, really the why of the activity, almost to the point where maybe it's overemphasized, but perhaps that's, that's what's necessary. Um, I do think this is an interesting construct, and if I had all the time in the world, I would study this more, and I, I plan to maybe really pick it up some more, um, but I do think if we can establish that foundation first, that's really key, and um, it helps us to shape expectations more precisely, so that way that the learning guidance will enhance the student's success a lot better. Um, if you're interested in, in knowing more, especially about that article, you can start with the stamp and naps. It was 1990 in the Quarterly Journal of Speech. And then uh, there was a follow-up commentary article to that where it basically just um, really questioned what, you know, this is not the construct really to study. And, and it really kind of blasted, I think, the work a little bit. And if you're interested in TILT, um, the best place to start is tilthighered.com. Um, that's where I've really enjoyed seeing some of the other resources and information about it. And that is my...
presentation. So I'll go ahead and do a stop share. And, <laughs> and thank you. So um, we've got just a little bit of time for, for questions or comments, but I have to admit, Dr. Terry, Madeline, and Dr. Gamble, your all's work has an, a, a very central theme. Talking about how I think, and it's not so much history, how we're trying to erase some parts of history. You know, Dr. Terry, you're, you know, you all are in your line of work, um, you're, you're having to work harder to educate people why vaccinations are important. And, and now you've got this COVID coming in, just muddying the waters a little bit more. And of course, Madeline, you uh, demonstrated how um, the Jackson Purchase area has worked to really conceal it's dark history, but it's a dark history. We have to, we have to talk about it. We can't, it's like you said, we cannot let any healing begin until we've talked about this. And then Dr. Gamble, oh my gosh, that was amazing how even some artists um, have even kind of, kind of laid low on some of their intent maybe of, of their work. So I don't know, I'll just kind of open the floor for any, those are my big observations that I noticed, but any questions or comments that y'all wish to, to make? Yeah, I think definitely, especially Madeline's, you know, what's happening in, in Murray with the Move the Monument project, uh, especially because it went up during Jim Crow. I mean, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a neutral uh, object. Um, uh, has a huge, you know, it, it's interesting at being a sculpture scholar, but also someone who studies uh, fascism uh, because uh, it, monuments don't last forever uh, in all of history of monuments. <laughs> and as public sentiment changes and, and they also have power. And so as sentiment changes, they get moved. Um, uh, you know, there, there aren't any statues to Mussolini up anymore. There are there is a strong neo-fascist um, uh, contingent in Italy still like there is in, in lots of these post-authoritarian countries. But um, yeah, I think it's uh, 100% kind of related to that. Um, and, and I think that too relates to, you know, these issues with public health and racism and those kinds of things that we see just having huge impacts today. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions? I do want to know if any, if anybody, if everybody would like to contribute, um, or you don't have to, but y'all have got these great projects. So what's the next step? Well, I'm supposed to be working on journal articles. <laughs> it's been a little bit more difficult um, this last few uh, years, just because um, at Murray State, you know, I teach a lot more compared to other department chairs, so I, my research is really the area that suffers, um, but yeah, just working on the research articles, but I do actually have um, a couple questions that um, I should have probably jumped in earlier, but um, Dr. Schemberger, for yours, when you're talking about intent, do you see that, um, especially now with the Murray State University's partnerships with academic partnerships, um, their push toward course maps and sharing those with the students and directly linking those and even quality matters because uh, that really emphasizes that too. And that training is all about intent and making sure that the students lump um, or really understand why you're assigning something. And so do you recommend the use of course maps be given to the students um, to really make those explicit connections? Because I'll say I've shared my course maps and my students are like, I don't know how to read this or even rubrics. I feel like I spend more time trying to explain why I'm giving that information to them and how to use it than I actually see that they're finding it useful by making those connections when I, I can just have that conversation with them. So I want to get other people's um, experience with providing those resources because, I mean, it does help us as the instructor make it more clear to us and how to maybe better elaborate our intention on those assignments. And then Madeline, you'll be next. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, just real quickly, I don't share the actual course worksheet with students, but I do put on the overview page um, that by the end of this module that you, you will be doing this and this. So it, I usually have anywhere between maybe, uh, some modules only have one learning objective and that's, that's fine. It just depends on really what is that purpose. Um, so I'll, I'll share all of that. Now, what I have encountered though, do students read that? And that's kind of where we have the problem. So then when the assignment is provided, I do map that back. Now I've had students in previous semesters ask me, what does MLO2 mean? I've been seeing this and I asked another student and they said, I think we has, has something to do with learning objectives. And that gave me an opportunity. It, it provided me a lesson. So then the following semester, actually it was this, yes, this semester, um, I, I did a course tour video and I share with them, this is what assignments will look like. This is why I'm sharing this with you. So I'm really demonstrating that intent a little bit more, but also it's instructions for them to know how to read really what's in those parentheses, MLO, one, two, three, or whatever. Um, and then likewise on that overview page, why is it CLO, one, two, three, four, or whatever, you know? So they, they start, you know, they'll see those connections. Um, so that's what I've done. Um, there's a lot to do with trying to establish intent, um, but those are the big things that I've been working on, and I think it helps. Now, they may not verbalize that as I see her intent, and that's okay. I don't really want them to verbalize it like that. I want them to, to say, I understand what Dr. S is wanting us to do, so that, that's my, my big thing. Yeah, I would say I, I similarly, I don't put the learning objectives on the assignments because the students, like even I find that language is so specialized that like they have no idea what it says. And you know, it's cause it's not, it's a specialized language. And so I, I, but I do talk about like, why am I giving you this assignment? And I talk about in class really kind of in, in as simple terms as I can. I find the students respond to that really well cause then they just don't feel like it's some throwaway thing I'm making them do it, it has a kind of intention you know I'm, I tell them my intention you know and I think that's really like your your talk uh really spoke to that I think in an, in an important way um yeah all right Ma mandolin um or Madeline, sorry. <laughs> I have a mandolin, Madeline, Maddie, Madison, so I apologize. Um, so Madeline, in our area, and Dr. Gamble hit on that with our Move the Statue uh, movement, and a lot of our African-American citizens spoke out against it too. So sundown towns are still very active today, and um, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, which, you know, as your research pointed out, we're trying to hide that, um, even though there's actually still some sundown towns in the Jackson Purchase area. Um, and on a side note of that, before I get my question to you, um, you know, Amazon Prime actually just released a series called Them, and it actually highlights a lot of the uh, sundown town and um, the issues and they call it race racism terror um or terrorism and it was actually really good i had to uh binge watch it just because i was so fascinated with some of the themes that they were um highlighting and especially because it's still very um relevant to our time and um one of my friends recommended it to me and i thought it was great so i'm recommending it to to you guys because it was good and it goes back to the themes that you mentioned in your research. But going specifically to your presentation, you mentioned Marshall County's Tater Day celebration. Um, and I I will say I'm not aware of the, the background of that. So I just wanted to know if you could briefly kind of describe what the background is of Tater Day, because I have no idea. I mean, I've been in, in Murray for six years and, and you know, I will say uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm not familiar with um, regarding our history. Um, so that was just kind of interesting because you mentioned Tater Day. I'm like, wait, I want to know more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I had 
never heard of Tater Day. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I had never heard of any of that. Don't even really remember. I don't even really recall seeing a Confederate flag in other than in a history textbook, um, which was kind of shocking because St. Louis isn't geographically that different or that far from Western Kentucky. Um, so I had to go to um, many of my friends from the area who some speak highly of Tater Day, some do not, um, and have them explain a little bit to me. And I found a commonality between it was that the people I asked, none of them really knew the origins of it directly. Um, but um, I learned and it was um, covered by a, a couple sources, but um, none really academically supported or reviewed. Um, so I can't say 100% accuracy, um, but it started around 1843, I think. Um, and it was traditionally supposed to be um, just like celebrating springtime and the weather changing. And um, I, I imagine that it turned into kind of a marketplace of trade with the new crops and the plants that were growing. Um, but as for as for how it changed, now I have I have never attended, um, but pictures I've seen, you know, I don't see as many crops as I do um, very large gas guzzling, gas guzzling trucks with Confederate flags hanging off the back of it. Um, and I've heard a I've heard a rumor that um, the Ku Klux Klan was stationed at Tater Day one year, um, but that is just something I've heard through word of mouth from several people, but I haven't found anything able to support that. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure on the origins of the changes. Um, my one suspicion is that, um, my one suspicion is that it could possibly be just tied to the generations because many people in this area have been here for many generations. So then if that was something um, their great grandparents did and their grandparents did um, and their parents spoke highly of, then it could just be passed through tradition like that. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with a festival like that, but it could also, and I've never attended, but I could see it also becoming a breeding ground for those ideas and attitudes to gather or people can learn more about that or little kids um, seeing the Confederate flags and wondering what that is and asking maybe the wrong person. Um, so I, I'm not exactly positive on the link, but I'm really glad you asked that question. I still truly do not know the true essence of Tater Day. I'm not really sure if I want to, um, but um, yeah, but I, I'm really glad that um, you, Dr. Gamble and Dr. Terry both mentioned um, the Confederate monument that is in downtown Murray. Um, my first two years here, I did not know we even had a downtown. And when I drove through, I was like, this is not downtown, but it is. Um, and so when I've started participating in the protests to take the Confederate monument down, um, which I've heard rumored to have a uh, still working drinking fountain inside of it that was once for whites only. There's truth to that. Okay. Um, but the most shocking thing for me to see that, and there's Confederate monuments in St. Louis too, um, but, and all over the nation, but the most shocking thing for me to see that was the large amount of people that support it being there. And there was one night when we were out protesting 
And um, the protesters were certainly outnumbering the people protecting the statue, but they were all wearing um, shirts with Confederate flags on them and they brought Confederate flags and they were all um, Caucasian from my point of view. And they were all surrounding this monument as if it was like a child they needed to like protect and form a circle around. And one of their arguments was that um, these college educated folk who want to remove the statue, um, you just go to college here, you're just students. So number one, you're in their, in their view, you're, you're young yet. So you don't really know what the real world is like. And two, you're not from this area. So you don't understand the culture. And that was really something that hit my research hard because I'm like, well, as an outsider, I feel like I have a good view on the situation historically. Um, but um, like, if it's such so ingrained in culture and so many people find controversy with it, is that really a culture that should be perpetuated? And um, I've found when I ask people about that specific culture, they, they kind of waver around giving direct responses. I've heard, you know, arguments for states' rights and things like that, um, but certainly nothing direct. So either they're concealing something or they don't even really understand the culture themselves. And it's just something that's been carried on through generations. Um, but I'm really glad you touched on those. I apologize for not knowing more about Tater Day, um, but I'm really glad that you brought those up. And I just wanna say that I was really impressed with all of your research. Um, Dr. Terry, the connection to COVID was um, particularly interesting, especially because of this time we're having with the pandemic. Um, and um, so I have, I have just, just a couple questions. Um, oh, and Dr. Schemberger, I actually found your presentation very motivating and inspiring. And I wrote down some quotes that I'm gonna remember about having intentions and um, a criteria for success and creating a purpose and a task. Um, but I have just a couple questions if there's time. Um, I'll start with Dr. Terry. Um, did you find that in in had had you start first have you had you started this research prior to the pandemic hitting and second how do you think your research transformed throughout the pandemic those are good questions. Uh, yes, my that research started um, long before <laughs> we uh, hit the pandemic, um, which is interesting because, yeah, we were collecting data along with the uh, Grace County Health Department as part of their grant in summer of, I want to say, 17 or 18. I mean, it's been a few years now. Um, but the funny thing is, is Kentucky's always battling something that could have been prevented through vaccinations. And that's really what came out of that research with that health department. And then with COVID, we're seeing those same themes. And then when we're going toward um, health disparities, you know, if you know the history of the Tuskegee experiments, you know, African Americans are very hesitant right now to get vaccinations, and um, there's reasons why. I'm not going to discount those, because when you actually understand the history, there's a lot of stuff there, and then, um, as I mentioned, I serve on school board, and quite a few of our teachers in our school got vaccinated. And of course, one of the school board members said, well, what happens to those who have who are electing not to get vaccinated? I don't think I would want my kid to be in that classroom. And here's me like I can't get vaccinated because I'm breastfeeding and vaccines are not tested on pregnant and breastfeeding moms. And I kind of was like, well, 
there's other teachers who are in the same predicament as me. And that's kind of, you know, going on the opposite side. Now you're discriminating against people who can't get vaccinated and it's none of your business for why they can't or choose not to. I mean, that's why we have, you know, HIPAA and some of those other laws. So it was just kind of interesting because it kind of took me aback. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I forget. I'm a public health expert on here, but uh, it wasn't my job to, at that time to educate, but I, you know, talking about my experiences here, you know, vaccines cannot be uh, tested on vulnerable populations and pregnant and breastfeeding moms is one of those, uh, one of those groups, just like children are one of those groups. And so it's like, there's reasons. And then what about those who have uh, allergic reactions to the ingredients in vaccines? So there's tons of reasons of why people don't get vaccinated, but if someone's not getting vaccinated because of fear or lack of education, those are things that we can address. But um, going to that other side of someone being discriminated against for not getting vaccinated also needs to be addressed. And that's coming more and more um, common. I mean, you can look at Facebook posts and see that. And so even those are looking or are starting to trigger like the types of research that I want to do in addition to like as a extension of what I'm doing now, which again has taken a life of its own because this is not typically what I would be doing. But again, it is linked to um, disability uh, discrimination and some of those other things. Like I wrote a note to myself. I'm like, oh, I should really look at exploring the future implications of the COVID SARS um, outbreak or pandemic on health and occupation because uh, as I mentioned about the military and so I mean that has huge implications but even disability discrimination um, or the anti-vaxxer discrimination which they're being ca categorized as anti-vaxxers when really there's so many other implications in there instead of just that you know, everybody lumping them together. Cause again, I felt bad for not being able to get vaccinated, but I'm like, again, my doctor's telling me not to because, and it's like, I shouldn't have to explain that. And, and again, going to the sunshine laws, you know, this, all of our meetings are open records and my quote could potentially be out there for somebody and I don't want that to potentially come back and reflect on me or so I just again was very careful about not responding I'm just like mm, smiling nodding but you know there's issues with that too of just smiling and nodding and letting that misinformation go out there and you know but I was trying to be cosmic of time and place and not wanting to be misquoted by our media because that tends to happen in Murray. <laughs> and I didn't want to be a scapegoat at that time because I think I had a feeling that that's probably what would have taken place. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long-winded uh, explanation to your question, but. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Um, thank you so much. Um, that sounds like quite a predicament. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in that. Um, um, Dr. Schember, Schemberger, I, um, I wanted to know your thoughts on how you feel intention in, in academic work might impact student success, because I think I would have performed a lot better in high school if I thought there was a purpose to all the busy work we were doing. And, and that's why I think this is really important. I have heard um, colleagues over time um, all across campus um, who have indicated giving students work to do just to give work to do. Um, and I think if we, and I think that's one thing, a, a disservice, um, but that, that tells you what the academic model how we are operating under this design that we feel sometimes we have to keep you in the classroom for the entire period of time that you're slated to be in there when really, again, what are the learning objectives? 
I tell my students more so on the graduate level than maybe the undergraduate, but you know, there've been times even undergraduate, if we are finished 15 minutes early, we are finished 15 minutes early. I'm not going to give busy work um, because that, that won't mesh into anything. Maybe it could reinforce some things, but I like to design my learning experiences for students. Um, and, and that's why I'm, I'm not gonna just give them something to do just to keep some time but I understand why other faculty feel that way. Um, so I think if we were to examine, if we were to use intention as a guiding construct in planning effective lessons, so even our own lectures, um, effective activities in the classroom, you know, maybe some think pair shares, discussions, um, even just solo, you know, for a few moments, solo work time, um, are those going to enhance the lesson better? Um, the assignment. So everything is done by design. So I, I think that's where I, 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 I'm hopeful, as Dr. Terry mentioned, Quality Matters. Um, it's, a, it's an assurance program in which helps us, helps instructors to determine whether um, the various pieces of instruction, do they all align? Um, and I think that's where we're going to see not just higher ed, um, even K through 12, I think we're gonna start to see more strengthening of that. But we do need to allow ourselves some time to determine what is my intent? What am I really wanting students to do and why so? Definitely, um, that sounds like a, a really good approach. Thank you, excellent. All right, I appreciate all of you, I know we've gone over, but man, these are some great discussions, great research. And to me, this is what I think education is all about. So, um, but I, I do wanna be mindful of time and I know people have other meetings, but thank you all so much for taking the time out to share your work. And I'm gonna go ahead now and, um, and stop recording the session. So I'll just go ahead and click stop. And thank you anyone who might be watching at a later time.